So, uh, from the time I was born, I remember people giving me nicknames. Not necessarily ones that were fun. Uh, some referred to my head, my head size. Some were that I was slow. Some were that I was ugly. Sometimes they were not outright like said, but they were. That was just a loud one. Sometimes it's not things that were said, but they were inferred, right? You're an accident, you're a disappointment, you're not the favorite, and stuff like that. Uh, I believe that words hold power, and I believe that we need to be careful about the kinds of words that we let define us. Uh, you're not fat, you're not lazy, you're not depressed. Those may be things that you struggle with, but they are not the things that define who you are. <laughs> what defines you, define you, is the fact that you are a child of the king. And knowing your identity is important because the world is going to come along and try and label you and try and tell you who you are and try and tell you how you live. So uh, as we get into this, we need to do a little bit of background history. Humanity uh, had rebelled and was kicked out of God's uh, presence in the garden. And God set in motion a plan to restore humanity. And he chose a man named Abraham. Oops. There we go. Goodness. There we go. Abraham. Uh, Abraham, uh, he, and he promised Abraham land. He promised him descendants that would be as numerous as the stars in the heaven and as the sands on the, on the seashore. He promised him a blessing and that his descendants would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Uh, it was an unconditional promise. There's nothing that they needed to do. This was God saying, I am going to do this to you, for you, with you. So Yahweh ended up renewing this covenant with every generation after Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And then the Hebrews ended up in Egypt as slaves. They forgot their identity. They forgot their God. And Yahweh had to reintroduce himself to Moses. And uh, he also reintroduced the concepts of the covenant and the promises that he had made to Abraham. But he also made a new covenant. It's called the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, uh, promised deliverance. It promised the seal of the covenant. It promised the law that we know about, but it also promised the rituals of being in God's presence. That that was all part of of the covenant, but it also included the consequences. If they did not live in obedience to the covenant, Yahweh said in Leviticus chapter 26, I will lay your cities to waste. I will make your sanctuaries desolate. I will not smell your pleasing aromas. I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and I will unsheathe the sword after you and your land shall be a desolation and your cities shall be waste then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy these Sabbaths. So they're safe. They're in the land as long as they are able to keep the covenants, as they are able to keep their part of it. All they have to do is to live in obedience to God's commands. Take Saturdays off, circumcise your children, you know, those kinds of things. So they entered the promised land, and then came the period of the judges. After conquering the land, the Israelites didn't feel a need to have a covenant anymore. We got it. We've, we're, we've arrived. We don't need that anymore. Same thing when they got down to Egypt. They, they forgot God and their, their blessings. And what began was 400 years of cycles of falling into idolatry, which led to foreign oppression, the judgment of God. While they were, uh, eventually they would realize, hey, wait a minute, we used to have a God that would deliver us from this. Maybe if we turn back to him, he'll help us out, which is what happened. And he would choose a judge who would deliver them, bring them prosperity, which again, then they would figure, oh, we're doing fine. We don't need God anymore, which led to idolatry, which led to that cycle going over and over and over for 400 years. Oh. After 400 years of being led by the judges, uh, which clearly didn't work. The 12 tribes got together and said to Samuel the prophet, hey, listen, you need to tell God we want a king. God warned them about what a king could be like, but that began the period of the United Kingdom under King Saul. 
Uh, God's first choice was Saul. Saul had the opportunity to be God's man, but he failed. Uh, he was exactly the kind of king that they didn't want. So God chose another one uh, named David. David was, uh, he made big mistakes too, maybe even bigger mistakes than Saul. However, the difference was David knew how to repent and to humble himself and to turn back to God. And so Yahweh made a covenant with David, which is called the Davidic Covenant, so 2 Samuel chapter 7, which reiterates the promises of a land. And it adds to the covenant that one of David's descendants will sit on the throne eternally. So David then is succeeded by his son Solomon, who is a builder. He builds a temple. He builds a palace. He builds a kingdom. And uh, he also builds the temple. And at the dedication of the temple in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, he makes a promise with Solomon that if they are being attacked by invaders, if they are, and they turn to the temple, they would humble themselves, seek God's face and pray, then he would heal the land and restore them. Well, that's a nice promise, right? I mean, that's the, the solution to it all. The descendants of Abraham, to whom God had made the promise, they had the promised land, they had a promised king, they had the promise of the presence in the temple, uh, the presence of God, and uh, unfortunately, power and politics are difficult to manage by most humans, especially in a godly way. And under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, a civil war breaks out, and the kingdom is divided. Rehoboam's arrogance caused a division that lasted for over 200 years. As you can see, the kingdoms, they break up. There's the northern kingdom. And the I couldn't, unfortunately. These are the northern kings, but they should be green. These are the southern kings, but they should be orange. But it's flip-flopped. I'm sorry, I couldn't change that. So sorry about the confusion. That's all I could do. So these are the, the kings of Judah that remained in Jerusalem, and these are the northern kings. Most of the kings, there was 10 tribes that broke away. Uh, all of the kings in the north were bad. Most of them were replaced by murder and intrigue and, and stuff like that. It was devastating up there. It was a more powerful kingdom than Judah was. It was The palaces were made of ivory, and they, they were just famous for how beautiful and opulent the kingdoms uh, uh, in Samaria were, uh, the kingdom um seat the palaces and stuff like that but because of their pride and rebellion god enabled the assyrian empire to eliminate judah assyrian empire is this whole area here uh, eliminates the um northern kingdom of israel you see the little kingdom of judah still remains intact there's an amazing story in scripture of how god provided protection for the little tiny kingdom of judah against the assyrian empire at that point um so uh, then comes along after the Assyrian Empire, we have the Babylonian Empire. And Babylon uh, is that city uh, known to be the cradle of civilization. The Garden of Eden was somewhere in this region. The city was founded by Nimrod after the great grandson of Noah, who was a great hunter. Uh, the, table, uh, the Tower of Babel was there. And about 625 BC, their first great king, Nabopolassar, was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. And in 612 BC, they defeat the Assyrians, and the Assyrian Empire just is enveloped into what is now the Babylonian Empire. Babylon becomes the poster child for evil government and an evil empire. Uh, Babylon is mentioned over 300 times in scripture as the city of evil, the mother of harlots, and those kinds of things. So you can tell that uh, Babylon does not have a, a tender spot in the heart of God uh, that way. Is, is there a Babylon? Who's Babylon today? Babylon is a destroyed city. It's in the city, it's the country of Iraq. Uh, but it is, the, the remnants are there. Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild the ancient city, but God promised that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So you know what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. So, this evil empire stands at the door, stands at the gates of Jerusalem at the beginning of this book. That's where we are. That's where the book of Daniel opens. And we will meet a teen boy who is a young teen boy, uh, you'll see, who is captured by this most evil of empires, taken prisoner, and somehow learns to serve both 
God and this evil empire without compromising on his character and integrity. And I get, and I would uh, submit to all of us that this is a great model for us as we enter into this political season, uh, uh -huh. how to do both. So Daniel chapter one, beginning at verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So first of all, Nebuchadnezzar comes in about 605, uh, 606. We're not exactly sure, but he comes and lays siege to the city, and that can take years. They surround the city. They don't let anything in. They don't let anything out, uh, trying to starve them out or until they can you know, uh, get in. That's the easy way to do it. Otherwise, they have to do it by force. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar is just a prince. He's not the king of Babylon yet. But in 605, his father dies. And so he can't complete the destruction of Jerusalem. He has to run back to Babylon to lay claim to his throne uh, back there. So he can't do it. But in the meantime, he submits. He's able to uh, subjugate uh, Jerusalem. So despite all the warnings from the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, the Judeans, remember the southern kingdom is Judea, and uh, Judah, they become the Judeans, which is in in uh, German, Judah, which is where we get the word Jews. That's where we get the word Jews. So they'll be called Jews from now on. Had a superstitious belief that since God had promised the land, God had promised them a king. He promised them a holy city. He promised his presence would be in the holy city and in the temple itself that was built. So therefore, we can't be defeated. The Assyrians came and tried it. Even when Nebuchadnezzar came, before he could absolutely destroy the city, he had to leave. And so there, God is protecting us. He will not let us be defeated. And so this kind of adds to the superstition, the fact that Nebuchadnezzar's dad dies, and so he has to leave. The Assyrians had a devastating plague that hit them, and he had to leave. And they all see that as part of it. It just fuels the superstition that they can't be defeated and it doesn't matter how they live god has his hand on the city and on the people and, and yet verse two says yahweh gave underline that part yahweh gave i don't know what your version says yeah yahweh and that's what that's the word yahweh in the literal scripture it's the superstitious part that puts the lord in there yahweh gave jehoiakim the king of judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. This is the unthinkable day. How, how, how does this happen? It, you know, we're God's people, God's land, God's city, God's temple, and it's all been, they stole God's stuff utensils like they took the stuff out of his house how does yeah. that happen yeah. it's all gone and it was done by a pagan king on top of that god's god's dinnerware is in the temple of their chief god bell also called marduk or merodach who's his commonly the, the the picture of him is just a dragon a skinny dragon and is is Yahweh only the God of Judah? Does his power not extend beyond our borders? Is 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 he not the king of the world that we thought he was? Is it is it only good for here? Is he is he not strong enough if he is the God? I mean, is, is he just not able to protect us? So why is this happening? Second Chronicles chapter 36 says, because they broke their covenant with God. He told them, if you don't keep the covenants, if you don't keep the Sabbath, if you don't have your children circumcised, if you don't keep the, the dietary laws. I'm going to kick you out, and I'm going to give the land its Sabbath without you. And so they broke the covenant, and God promised this would happen. Who's in charge? It's not Babylon. It's not Nebuchadnezzar. Yahweh's in charge. It said that, right? God gave. Yahweh gave. The Did theme. Second Chronicles 31. 36. 36. Verses 11 through 21. So the theme of this book that we're going to see all the way through the book is that God is in charge. God is sovereign. God is great. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. 
if we believe this, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what destruction you're in because God is still in control. So as we read the book of Daniel, which there's going to be some crazy problems happening. The book is not about what's going to happen in the future. The book is about that no matter what happens in the future, God is in control. God is in control. And he wants to give us that assurance. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. So the question then becomes, if things are going to go crazy around us, how then can I live faithfully in the midst of a government that is clearly not being obedient to God's word? And how do I live faithful to both? Is that even possible? It's just don't try to think. That's, that's what... Here's the thing. I'm preparing for this message last week, and I and I was I had a meeting that I had to go to Costa Mesa. So I'm like, I turn the radio. I never listen to talk radio or to to like sermons on the radio. I just don't do podcasts. I don't do it. Just is not my thing. I turn on the radio, and Jay Vernon McGee oh. starts a study in the Book of Daniel. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. all right, I can listen. So I listen to it on the way back from my meeting that Jay Vernon McGee is just finishing. Rick Warren comes up. I'm starting through the book of Daniel chapter one. I was like, okay, Lord, I'm listening. So I'm hoping, I'm trusting, I believe that Daniel is the right book for us to be studying right now as we get into this season. So, so, yeah. so who's in power in this book? Being in control is not the same as having power. Oh. Uh, they are not the same thing. The Babylonians, the pagans are in power. But they are not the one who is in control. Sometimes what God is doing in your life is more important than the freedom to do what you want or to be in control because he's trying to accomplish something. Even his name is not as important as what he's trying to accomplish. Because clearly people are saying, well, Yahweh can't be God because look at his temple is destroyed. His people are gone. They're wiped out. They're, they're devastated. So, but who is in control? Yahweh's in control. And the reason I keep going back to Yahweh again, I want to remind us, because his name is a promise. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who always was and always will be the same. I had power, I have power, and I will have power all the way to the end. So you, whenever you see his name, it's a promise that that power still works and is still available. So Daniel chapter, verse 1, verse 3. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both royal family and of nobility, youths, royals. Uh, you know, they would take the children of the royals because then they would put a puppet king in. But they'd also say, I've got your kids. If you ever want to see your kids again, you better not rebel. And then they're also going to train up their kids to think they're the good guys. What do they call that? The Stockholm Syndrome? Yeah. So that they think I'm the good guy anyway. They're not going to like you. So you better be obedient to me. So the, pick up youths without blemish of good appearance. They had to be handsome and healthy, uh, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with all knowledge, understanding and learning, competent. They had to smart, be smart. They had to be intelligent and they had to be wise to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So they took of the royal families of the uh, the elite classes of uh, the Judeans, uh, young boys, 13 to 14 year old. Imagine that age. I imagine I've seen college kids that I look at and I'm like, man, you're just a, you're just a child. Yeah, yeah. 13, 14 years, you're, you still are a child, but your body's just a little bigger. And, you know, they're handsome, they're smart. Their voices are changing, and all of a sudden, they're taken away from their teachers. They're taken away from their parents. Anybody who really cares about them being Jewish, and they're put in the palace, and they're given permission to eat, to drink, and do whatever they want to, as long as they do it under the, the, God, the guise of the empire. No parental control. Imagine, you know, you, you give a million bucks to any kid and say, go do what you want. How many American kids are going to last a week? You know, if they go out with their buddies and, and, and do that, if you give them success and power and authority, most kids probably will kill. And if they don't kill someone else, they'll kill themselves. 
that why you put that in the where am I? <laughs> Did you put that in there? No, I didn't do it. You know, I don't know how to look at <laughs> Well, here's Justin Bieber. Here's the, <laughs> you know, Macaulay Cock and think of all the child stars that were given power and success and, you know, access to drugs and alcohol and all that kind of thing. Macaulay Cock and Britney Spears, Judy Garland, the list goes on. Here's a bunch more. It's such a thing. Hulu just had released a special on this uh, a couple weeks ago that he, where, how, why does this happen? To them why, why do they, I don't know why the world thinks this is such a mystery but the point being most people let alone most young people let alone most I'll say children 13 14 year old can't handle unlimited success or access to put to, to pleasure these young boys young teen boys young teen boys away from their parents away from their teachers away from their religious authorities all those kind of things and they have a, a guy that's goading the mom, go for it, go for it, go for it. I'll give you whatever you want. They're taught the ways of the Babylonians. They're indoctrinated to follow their leader. Mm. Hitler did this with the Hitler youth. That was the whole, the whole thing. Uh, they're not allowed to worship Yahweh, though. Verse 5 says, the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. They get the best stuff. You're getting what the king got. The only problem is... It's already sacrificed to idols. It's already dedicated to idols. In the first place. It's the same stuff as the king. Uh, it's the good life. They were educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Now they're younger men, older boys. You know, they're still in that, but they're, they're more young men at this point, age 16 to 17. They look like Jews. They walk like Jews. They dress like Jews. But on the inside, they've been trained to, to think and to be Babylonians. They are trophies of the conquering king because as they wore, they're encouraged to be themselves on the outside. Because as, as people would come to this court and they'd say, oh, those are Judeans and those are Egyptians. And those they're like, wow, this king has conquered everybody. Look who's in his court. So it was good for you to have your uniqueness, but you're not supposed to think on the outside you can be whatever, but on the inside, they want you different. Verse 6 says, among these men were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. Notice anything about their names? They're on the screen. They've all got God's name as a part of their name. L is part of God's name. Yahweh is part of names. The I A H is part of Yahweh, so that's part of his uh, his name as well. So those are called uh, the, the topic names. So they have God's name included inside of them. Well, that's not going to work if you're in a pagan empire. So what's he going to do? He's going to change their names. Verse seven. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names. Daniel. He became Belshazzar, which means keeper of the prince of, treasures of the prince of Bel. Hananiah, he called Shadrach, which means illumined by Shad, the sun god. Mishael, he called Meshach, who is, uh, who is, which means who is like Shrak, who is the love goddess, which I think is hilarious. I wonder if that Love Shack song comes from that. Okay. <laughs> um, Azariah, he called Abednego, which means the servant of the fire, uh, Nigo, which is the fire god. Their names are a reminder to this, to us, that the world is always going to try and define you, no matter what you want to be called, in all its rebellious form. So we're, we're going to end with those first seven verses this week. So now what? We're going to see that Daniel becomes one of the most powerful men and a leader in not just one empire, two empires. Because <laughs> this empire is not going to last. Another empire is going to come up behind them. And he's going to go under four kings over the next 70 years. Wow. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel is going to be uh, in there. He's going to be, he lives at the same time. He's writing about the same time. He mentions Daniel three times in his book. Daniel lived between 620 BC and about 530. So about 90 years and 70 of that is in captivity. He writes the, this book takes place between about the age 12 to 14 and about the age of 90 for him. We believe the book was written during captivity, probably not as his the 14-year-old self. He probably writes most of it later. Some scholars, though, because the prophetical things we're about to read are so accurate, 
some scholars will say, so this book couldn't have been written till at least 165 BC, another 400 years later, because uh, there's no way this, this could be this accurate. The only problem with that is, uh, first of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'm gonna put that up there. So can we but trust the book of Daniel? First of all, Daniel, there's eight copies, complete copies of Daniel that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is pretty awesome. Except the Dead Sea Scrolls are older than 165 BC. So they existed. They were considered to be scripture, which if somebody wrote it in 165, you might sneak it in the library, but you're not going to have eight copies of it that's all that's considered to be a part of scripture at that point. It took time, it takes time for those things to be uh, considered part of scripture. Um, the second part, uh, Flavius Josephus, Josephus, the historian who was a Jewish man, he wrote on behalf of the Roman Empire after he was conquered. He wrote that when Alexander the Great, the Greek guy, uh, as he's tromping across the Middle East, he comes to conquer Jerusalem. And as he come, conquers Jerusalem, the priest comes out waving the book of Daniel at him and says, wait, you're in the book of Daniel. You're here in the book of Daniel. Alexander the Great is so impressed he doesn't destroy Jerusalem. He allows, in fact, he goes up into the city and offers a sacrifice in the temple because he sees himself as the fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Daniel that's written 332 years. So 165 years before they say it had to be written in order. So Alexander himself, who is, sees himself in the book of Daniel, Daniel is, is considered to be a prophet uh, at that point as well. On top of that, uh, again, I told you that Ezekiel always was referring to him. So Ezekiel was contemporaneous with him as well. But more than that, Jesus believed in Daniel. He said he refers to the prophecy, the abomination of desolation in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. And he calls, Jesus calls Daniel a prophet. Yes. yes. Right? Yes. And, and here's the most, I think the most amazing part of it. Jesus favorite title for himself in the book of Mark is the son of man, which is the title that comes from the book of Daniel. So all of those are, are part of that. So I have no uh, qualms about calling this book legit and that the prophecies, yeah, it's amazing how detailed the prophecies are and how they come up. Isaac Newton, the prophet, or, or the, uh, the prophet, the, the scientist declared to reject Daniel is to reject the Christian religion. A few months ago, I was challenged by a pastor's wife in town that said, if you really love orange, I think I have one. No. We're back to that. Yeah. Uh, if you really loved orange, you would be confronting our city leaders on their personal sins. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I challenged that, you know, I, I listened to that. But in, as I prayed about it, um, some people are called to be Daniels or to be Jeremiah's and Isaiah's and to run through the streets naked and to be just, you know, this is the word of the Lord kind of a thing and to be calling people out there. That, there are people like that. And if that's you, God's blessing on you. But there are also Daniels. Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah are not the only kinds of prophet that there are. There are Daniels. And if you look at Daniel's life, he was trusted. He was able to speak truth into the ears of the emperors. And yet he was able to faithfully uh, live a life that was consistent with what the life that God was calling him to. Amen. Somehow in the midst of that tension, it's possible to do that. Yes, that's, the, that's the life I feel called to. And I do have the ears of our city leadership. I can say that with, I think you guys all know that. Uh, and we do have conversations. And for one of them, uh, for example, when the Duke of Orange, uh, I was asked to be a judge at the last Duke of Orange. And at the first part of the show, a couple of the guys, you know, when people get nervous, they start cussing. It's just kind of an easy thing to kind of fill that. And a couple of guys started cussing. And then one guy did it. And the next guy thought, well, if he thought they thought that was funny, I'm going to, and it, and it got out. So at the, at the break, the mayor was a judge with me. And our the mayor, mayor, what's that? Our current, mayor. our current mayor was a judge with me. And he turned to me and he goes, what do you think of that? And I said, well, if this is who the city of Orange wants to represent them, then I'm in the wrong place. Then I shouldn't be a judge here because this is not, I don't think that's appropriate. And I, it, but if that's what the city wants, then 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 I need to step aside. And, and, he, and that was the end of our conversation. Uh, we started the show back again and the, the 
uh, director of the, the whole thing got up and said that uh, the mayor had come backstage and spoken with them. She didn't say this part. I found this part out later. And um, they did, they made an announcement that cussing is not going to be allowed in the thing. That's the place I think Daniel plays in the team web. You don't hear him at a lot of meetings, but when big stuff happens, the emperors trusted that him and called them inside for a conversation, and they move forward based based on those kind of things, decisions. What's that? Knowing your place. Knowing your place. Knowing knowing your identity. Because if you know your identity, you have nothing to prove, right? Amen. God is great, and so I don't have to fear others. God is gracious, right? So I don't have to prove myself. So as we enter into this election empire, uh, election season, I see Daniel as a model for us in our involvement in politics. Uh, Daniel is a key example, again, of someone who lived righteously, and, but ministered in the context of an evil pagan empire. Some of us may be called to be Isaiah's and Jeremiah's, and God bless you if you're running around naked, I'll be following you with a towel. <laughs> but I'm not eating human poop roasted over fire purses. That's just not what God's called me to do, praise the Lord. But um, either way, the world doesn't care what we look like on the outside. You can be as religious as you want. You can do wear all the different things you want. But what they're concerned about is who you are on the inside. What the world wants is for you to be religious, do whatever religious activities you want to do. But you need to be progressive like us. An example of that is a new movie that's coming out that I'm not going to recommend. It's called Conclave. It's about the death of a pope and how they choose the next one. Well, the one they choose is a biological female that is uh, living as a male. Oh, wow. And so they're, they're trying to say, do all your religious stuff, but you need to think like us. Act like Babylonians. Uh, think like Babylonians. Do whatever you want, where, do your religion, whatever, but you need to be progressive like what us. We are in a culture war. And uh, so, so I guess what we need to recognize is the, some of the ways that the world is trying to influence us. Yes. So yesterday yep. there was a comment made um, and um, people were saying, what should we put in the card? Mm. And so we're saying... We, uh, we, three of us were saying, you can put whatever you want, something encouraging, or you can put scriptures if you want. And somebody said, uh, one particular person said, oh, uh, we don't, we're not that, we're Unitarian. Which was interesting to me because the thought was that the church is not unifying. Mm. So not Unitarian is a here. denomination. Oh. Yes. Well, uh, Unitarian, it's, it's, it's a denomination where you can believe whatever you want to. As long as it doesn't take away from other people. I, I took so I was in a Unitarian church designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And we went to every, the Muslim class was on one side, the Jewish class was another, the Christian class, the Sikh class, you know, they had classes for everybody. You all bring whatever truth you want to the table, as long as you're seeking after God. Yeah. So, um, you know. We've talked about how movies try and influence us, right? The message that are in movies, clearly this movie Conclave is gonna try and do that. Video games, you know, there's a whole like syndrome happening about young girls, specifically 80% of the, 87% of the girls that are getting Tourette syndrome from watching TikTok, they're girls. And um, TikTok is influencing and it's called a uh, mega psychotic, it, it's, they're not getting actual Tourette's, they're, it's it's a it's a group thing that's happening, and um, they'll get the ticks, they'll get the cussing, they get all of that because of uh, watching TikTok. Um, the world is doing this. We have to be careful of how we allow the world to influence us. Um, uh, the boys didn't have a choice in the names that they were given, but they had a choice in the lives that they were going to live. Uh, you may have names. Uh, uh, we have names that we choose to listen to. We have names that we choose to allow, even if they're not good names. We have that we we just heard so often that that it just kind of yeah that's me, that's who I am, and, and that's you know ugly fat skinny snob angry whatever it is. Our identity though has to begin with our relationship with Jesus. Uh, let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for. Um, that you are the one that defines who we are. Not our 
actions, not the words of the world, not even the way we look, uh, but it's our relationship with you. So I pray that, Father, that that would be our starting point. And you, would, if there are things that are in our hearts that are um, clouding that identity, I pray today that it would be a good place to begin chipping that away so that we can live only as your children. In your son's name, amen.